Um, thanks so much for being here on Election Day. My name is Chris Babbitt. I am one of the faculty co-directors at Berkman. Um, we have a great uh, session planned here today for you on Election Day. A couple of sort of housekeeping matters for those of you who've come to these lunches before. Um, please be reminded that we are live streaming, so say hello to the internet and this will be recorded online mm -hmm. uh, later, so bear that in mind if you ask a, a question or something of the sort. Please ask a question. We're going to talk for a little while, but then we'd like to very quickly uh, segue into uh, turning this into a conversation with the rest of you in the room. Um, and uh, I think that's it in terms of nuts and bolts. So when we were thinking about what we would do on uh, Tuesday, November 6th, uh, immediately we thought about the fact that we have um, uh, two uh, extraordinary experts, not just sort of the most uh, expert within the Berkman community, but really uh, expert uh, experts all around in Kathy Pham and Alvin Salehi in uh, the development and deployment and procurement of tech within government. Both of them have had um, significant roles, which we'll talk about in a little bit, in uh, federal government thinking about a lot of these issues. And rather than, I think, reading your bios, if you don't mind, I might ask if I could have each of you, before we kind of get into substance, just introduce yourself, say who you are, uh, what you do, how you came to do what you do, and then we're going to um, get into the conversation. So, Kathy, can I ask you to start? Yes. Hi. Thanks for coming. I uh, started my career in engineering um, and spent the last, probably spent about a decade uh, about places like Google and, and IBM building consumer tech, um, but also building technology for governments. And then, um, as some of you may have heard in the US, um, back in 2013, 2014, there was the healthcare.gov failure, um, and several folks from private sector came to help stabilize that website, um, and thus, like the story is that thus the United States Digital Service was was born in the U.S. government. Um, the real story is that actually maybe for about seven years or six years before that, there have been people trying to think of this idea of building out this tech entity inside government for a long time, and it took this like crazy fiasco to get people to pay attention and really establish something, which became the organization that I helped. Um, start and helped run, which is the United States Digital Service. Um, and that became a team of about 200 technologists. Um, i put that in quotes. It's engineers, designers, product managers, et cetera, who um, came and just worked on some of the hardest government technology failures around um, the, federal, the federal government. Um, and I, but really, I'd, this is an area that I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, I've done a lot of public service work um, in addition to a lot of my day job before that, so it was really just a nice fit to be able to apply that, to basically take everything that was public service and tech and things I cared about um, and put that into one, one role. Uh, my parents came to this country as refugees, um, and for me, the chance, that, the fact that they let me into the White House and into government to just do this work and have that kind of influence um, was that never, ever lost on me and will continue to never be lost on me, and some of that will come through as um, we talk more, but for me, just the chance to, regardless of any leadership or anyone in charge, the chance to really be in the room to help shape um, how we think about technology is really important. Um, and then I came to Berkman because I really wanted to be around a lot of other people who think about law and history and social science and policy in ways that I'd never really thought of before um, and really challenge my thinking that way and think about what to do there. Um, so I'm a fellow at the Berkman Center. I'm also a fellow over at Digital HKS. Um, at the Kennedy School, and I teach a class um, called Product Management and, and Society over there. Alvin? <clears throat> awesome. Hey, everybody. I'm Alvin Salehi. Uh, quick question. Obviously, it's a historic day in the United States. Show of hands, how many people have already voted? Very good. For people on the ceiling, that's actually a, a large a large population. How not, many? Not everyone is wearing their self-congratulatory <laughs> sticker. That's though, true. Guess, Some that's, places that's... don't have the stickers. Um, how many people are planning to vote later today? Great. If anyone did not raise your hands, please come talk to us afterward. We can have a discussion as to why it's important to vote. Um, so I'm Alvin Salehi. I am a research affiliate here at the Berkman Klein Center. I'm also a tech advisor at the White House. Important, important for me to say that I'm here in my capacity as an affiliate of the Berkman Center today, not in my capacity as a White House advisor. So anything that I do talk about will be public information. Um, 
So uh, quickly, my background, I started my career in government uh, several years ago. I am an attorney by trade and started at the Advanced Research Projects Agency at the Department of Energy. So if any of you are familiar with DARPA, uh, this is basically Energy's version of DARPA called ARPA-E, where we invested in transformative, high-risk, super high-reward energy technologies. Incredible experience. From there, went to the State Department to work on expanding internet access to Africa, uh, which was an incredible experience as well. Uh, happy to speak with you folks um, who come up afterward to talk a little bit more about that if we don't get into it today. And then moved over to the White House um, in 20, what was it now, 2015, back in the Obama administration. We were working there together in the office uh, of the federal CIO. That's where I started. And in 2016, August of 2016, I uh, authored the federal source code policy with an incredible team there. And uh, essentially, uh, what we did was we closed a multi-billion dollar government procurement loophole for software, which now requires that from this point forward, all contracts for custom developed software must allow for that software to be shared and reused across all federal agencies, which is actually leading to a bunch of savings for taxpayers. Because as many of you might know, uh, the government was essentially overpaying for duplicative software that it already procured due to a lot of different antiquated loopholes. So we tried to close those. And as part of that policy, we also created a platform called code.gov, which now essentially uh, inventories custom developed code across the entire federal government, as well as open source software to share it with taxpayers in an effort to ensure that you all can use it to leverage your own breakthroughs and innovation, to launch your own companies, and also to give back to the country through code. And hopefully we can get into a little bit of that during this discussion as well. Excited to be here. Thank you. That's great. So you've, you've both touched on a couple of different specific projects, but I wonder if we could drill down a little bit more and just talk for those who haven't really thought about this before. What, what exactly is, does a <laughs> a startup look like or a tech development initiative look like within the White House or within the executive branch of government, um, either uh, the US digital service as a whole or building the code.gov platform. How does that operate? How does it set an agenda? How does doing tech development in federal government differ from doing it at Google or at a private company? Before I do that, can we Please. also ask that you introduce yourself because your background <laughs> okay. is also so fascinating. All right. That's not, that's not as fun, but okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm Chris Babbitt. I'm a, a, a clinical professor here. I run our cyber law clinic. I know some of the people in the room as clients of the clinic. We do tech law and policy work with students. And um, a lot of our clients, really all of our clients, come from the world of public interest tech development, the idea of doing Clinical work in law school has been around for 100 years where you provide free pro bono legal services to deserving clients on legal issues. And and uh, the, the classic model for that are things like landlord-tenant clinics and um, family law clinics and other kinds of clinics that provide free legal services uh, to uh, deserving clients. The Berkman uh, Klein Center, then the Berkman Center in 1999 saw fit to establish this program that I work in now, um, again, coming up on our 20th anniversary, to sort of take that model and apply it to tech and so we have a lot of conversations all the time about what does it mean to be a deserving client or uh, an important uh, public interest social justice issue that has a technology angle to it so a lot of our clients are drawn from the private sector although mostly nonprofits uh, startups that are building tech in support of a public interest mission we do work with government organizations as well um, and uh, do everything from day-to-day -day advising, drafting of contracts, amicus advocacy in courts on important tech policy issues, um, that sort of thing. I'm very interested in government tech, again, partly because it informs our clinic docket, but also because I think we have um, been very focused at Berkman on uh, two different things. One is sort of educating policymakers and those involved in law and enforcement, whether it's state attorneys general or state legislatures or the federal legislatures, to, uh, to educate them about um, tech issues that come up in the in, in the context of their enforcement or legislative priorities. Um, and then we've also been thinking a lot about, probably more directly relevant to the work you both have done, um, questions that I hope we'll have a little time for around government uh, uh, creation, procurement, deployment of technologies that may have at their core bias and um, other, uh, other factors 
partially due to there being sort of black box technologies um, that we want to understand, whether it's a criminal justice uh, yeah. product, like a risk scoring algorithm used in pretrial services in so many states around the country, or other kinds of algorithmic tools that are used to distribute benefits mm -hmm. and other things. Um, how do we get government and the private sector and the academic sector and civil society talking about what these tools really do, how they work, um, making informed decisions very early on in the process of architecting new products to get out ahead of problems? So um, that's been a big part of the research work I've been working on. So, yeah. Tech development in, in, in government. Yes. Um, and I'll expand it beyond just the federal yeah. government as well. Um, so the US, U.S. Digital Service, I guess at this point, is almost four years old, um, which is a bit out of maybe startup -y phase. Um, but what that really looked like for us in the beginning was it was having a lot of air cover from a president that really believed in the technology um, by air cover it meant just having like the highest stake level leadership bought into this idea of bringing people with tech experts into government, which is candidly something that's really hard to do. Um, we had a convening this past summer actually with um, digital service teams across the world, ranging from Mexico and Peru and Nova Scotia and the UK, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. And one of the biggest problems is bringing talent into a government, whether it's pay, um, or having to move to a certain location in the US, it's DC and other countries in different, different cities. Um, or maybe just being like the only one in the room that's trying to do what you're doing where everyone else is is um, is kind of stuck in like policy or bureaucracy and it's, it's a hard environment so we were able to, to kind of have an outlet for people to come and do that kind of work. Um, so I think that's kind of what it looked like to be a bit of a startup to work on some of the highest priority and by highest priority we define that as being um, touch the most number of people um, in the most vulnerable populations and could maybe be reused across different federal agencies. And we're now seeing different versions of the United States Digital Service pop up, not only across the world. Uh, we've actually modeled ours after the UK, but also at diff um, in different cities around the country as well. Um, and, and having different cities really, and states actually, think about this model also of bringing talent into um, government so that you have people in the room who can make decisions around, if we're gonna buy a piece of software for the police department, what does that look like long term uh, versus just policy people making those kinds of, of decisions who oftentimes, many times are actually well intentioned and want to do the right thing, but maybe just don't understand the tech um, enough. So yeah, that's a little bit of what, but I also want to caveat that with the fact I actually hosted a session recently at, um, there was a public uh, interest summit at the Kennedy School that um, David Eves and Vanessa Ryan Smith put on. And I actually had a session called um, what can private sector actually also learn from the public sector. And there's also a lot of deep knowledge that the, pu the public sector understands about like the, the people and the humans it serves that the private sector can definitely learn from. And as you've many of you have seen now, like there's like this tech reckoning of, oh my God, what we've done in tech. Um, Sasha's in the room. I know Sasha's done a lot of work in that space. I think Bruce Schneier's doing some writing in that space. But there's also a lot that the um, in my opinion, the, the private sector can learn from the deep expertise um, of the public sector and how well it just understands its, its people as well. Awesome. Yeah, I'll echo what Kathy said as well. So <clears throat> if we kind of take a step back and think about the startup landscape in general, startups in general, what statistics tell us, over 90% of startups fail, right? That's a lot harder when you go into the federal government, which is essentially one of the most disabling environments on the planet. I mean, that's just a fact, because you have agencies that are so bureaucratically entrenched over decades, and it is very difficult to catalyze culture shift when you are essentially fighting an uphill battle. Uh, so I think for the USDS, the former administration helped catalyze that shift, which was a big deal. Of course, it did, in a way, need some sort of um, catalyst sort of uh, uh, event, right? Like the healthcare.gov fiasco, which then led to this development of the most incredible SWAT team, the tech SWAT team of the United States government. For us at code.gov, when I came in, there were efforts to try to figure out how we can leverage open source software across the federal government in a uniform way. You had a lot of agencies that uh, were kind of doing it in their own way, but there wasn't a uniform, consistent approach toward sharing government code with the public. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. If you're paying for us to build something, then you should be able to access at least some of it. And whether it's for transparency or for utility, um, it actually does make a lot of common sense. So we came into this uh, project with this approach that we have to figure something out. But 
open source software, a lot of folks in the private sector are opposed to it because whether it's based on a fundamental misunderstanding about the security aspects of open source software or whether it's driven by kind of a uh, profits generated motive around not wanting to share code that your company has built for another entity. So we were also facing an uphill battle against a lot of strong lobbyists. And in a way, if we had approached this, and some folks had tried this, by saying we're going to create an open source policy, the lobbying efforts would be way too strong and that would just be dead on arrival. So instead, we found something that more folks could agree on, which was that there is this multi-billion dollar loophole where if you are building something for us from scratch, for some reason in your contracts, you're telling us, I can only use it for my agency, but I can't share it with any other agency. That doesn't make sense. If you had another company build something for Google, you would never tell Google, hey, you can only use this for Google Search, but you can't use it for Google X, for example. So from that standpoint, we basically asked a lot of companies to come to the table. And we said, hey, we want to, out of courtesy, give you a heads up that this is essentially what we're going to do. Um, and you know, in law school, we always uh, are taught to try to see things from both sides. So I thought, maybe I'm missing something. So I asked them to come in, and I said, look, we're planning on doing this, but please tell me how you feel, because I want to make sure that we actually have a well-informed policy before we move forward with this. And almost all of the companies raised their hand, and they said, you can't do it. And I said, OK, great, why not? And many of them said, because the government has never done it this way before. The reason many of you are laughing because, is because status quo arguments never win the day, or at least they shouldn't. In fact, maybe that's even more reason why you should change it if the government has never done it this way before, especially when you are uh, essentially taking care of public money. You have a responsibility to make sure that you're spending that money efficiently. So I said, all right, I understand. You all are here. You have a fiduciary duty to your shareholders to protect their bottom lines. And so your job here is to make that argument. So we heard it. We can check that off. Let's move past that. As public servants, we also have a duty to the taxpayers to protect their bottom lines. And as far as I'm concerned, I think everyone in this room is a taxpayer too, so that duty extends to you as well. So if anyone actually thinks it's fair for us to pay multiple times for the same piece of software we've already built, please raise your hands. I would love to know who thinks that's fair. Of course, no one raised their hand at that point. So one person did raise their hand and say, all right, well, if that's the case, then we're going to have to charge more the first time around, because we're not going to be able to profit as much off of it. And I said, OK, that's your prerogative. But as you all know, government contracts are a competitive bidding process. So you can charge as much as you want. You probably won't win that contract. And in fact, we can finally level the playing field for other small companies to compete too. From that point forward, we were able to put pen to paper. We wrote the country's first ever federal source code policy, which gave rise to code.gov, which we then launched, get this, five days before the 2016 presidential election. We just got it through. It was number one on Hacker News. Everyone was super excited about it. And then the election happened, and everyone said, all right, Alvin, good job. It's time for you to leave. You know, it was a good effort. There's no way that this is going to last. And so I'm convinced that that would have been the reaction no matter what, because no matter what, whenever you have a transition in administrations, there is a lot that you have to get through, which is essentially you have to stick around to help the new administration transition. It makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of work and history that you need to help them kind of uh, transition toward. And so a lot of folks said, all right, a lot of people were leaving in droves. Uh, and our team, when we reframed it, we said, all right, if we're public servants, then we serve the public. And this platform has the potential to save potentially billions of dollars by cutting duplicative software. So we stayed. And of course, the first few months were difficult. Uh, we had to essentially make sure that our value proposition was as solid as possible. Once we demonstrated that this has the potential to save a lot of money for taxpayers, this administration was very supportive. Gave us the green light. We raised a couple million dollars to actually build a team. We built a full-fledged team of engineers, designers, comms folks. And code.gov was officially reborn. I kind of like to say that we were aqua hired by the Trump, Trump administration in a way. And so over the last year to two years, we've been running that program. And I'm proud to say that despite the fact that a lot of folks didn't even think this would survive, looking back two years later, when we first started the platform, we started with around 45 projects. Now we have over 4,000. And we're on track to save a bunch of money for taxpayers. So it was definitely worth it. And we're so excited to be able to continue moving forward. So I want to highlight a tension that I was, I'm hearing between some things that each of you said. Kathy points out that 
she thinks there's a lot that the private sector can learn from the public mm -hmm. sector in terms of how to do development. Public sector, maybe much more so than the private sector, really uniquely attuned to sort of constituents' needs. And, um, and then Alvin uh, says that the working in government can be among the most disabling of environments to work in and talks about sort of a really rigid adherence to the status quo, which doesn't feel like it lines up very well with an environment that's ripe for, for technical innovation. And I certainly think that there's a, there's a line that I'll just parrot about government technology, which is that it's inefficient, it's bad, it's old. Mm -hmm. We picture, when you talk about government technology, you picture going to the RMV or the DMV in some sort of a glowing amber colored screen yeah. from the <laughs> 1970s that has yeah. never been updated. Um, and uh, or, or you picture something like healthcare.gov, which again, I think is was viewed at, at the rollout, obviously, as having uh, having lots and lots of problems. And you could, might attribute that, some might attribute that to something inherent about doing complex tech development in government. Mm -hmm. So um, how do we resolve this tension? How do you, what can the private sector learn about mm -hmm. the way the public sector does tech development and procurement? And, um, and is it actually as sort of stifling to innovation as I think some might, uh, might have us believe? I actually can wear both hats on this all, for, for, for all day. You actually, for in your list of examples, you yeah. can add to it the fact that the Social Security website has office hours. So if you go, <laughs> if you try and access the SSA.gov website and try and log in between certain hours in the middle of the night, you will get the page of it's currently down um, for office hours. It just does not exist. You've told me this before, and I haven't tested it, but yeah, the, the website's literally closed. Yeah, the, the, way, the website is closed. You cannot use it. Um, and that's just, yes, it's. I didn't touch upon those parts, but it, it can be debilitizing. It's, um, in the US, it's an $86, $86 billion industry for tech IT. 94%, this was a number from, from a few years ago, but 94% either fail or never delivered or never see the light of day, or they just don't work, right? So that's really, really hard. I definitely don't want to underplay that. Like, There's definitely a lot we can, the, private, the public sector can also learn from um, the private sector, but I feel like I constantly hear that of how private sector is gonna come and save government. Um, but at the same time, when I was on the ground with the Veterans Affairs or on the ground with the Department of Education, on the ground with some of these states, social workers, et cetera, they understand their, their humans, the people they're trying to serve much more deeply than any of the teams I've ever worked on at Google, who worked on things like Google Health and Search, et cetera. Um, we maybe did user experience testing, but it, it was in my opinion, can stay pretty high level. And so to deeply understand how someone might use your newsfeed, deeply understand all the different ways people might use your Google search, um, and maybe not label some people as gorillas, um, and deeply understand the human population, I think there's a lot that the private sector can really learn from how deeply, um, so that's really what I mean by de how, how deeply there are many. And you know, there are many people in government who may not know how to tie the technology piece to the actual human piece and make that actually work together into like a piece of technology that actually works for the human. Um, but there's definitely a lot they do understand about uh, the human side of what they, they build. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the biggest dif distinction between the private sector and the public sector is that the public sector gets a bad rap. Um, sometimes it's warranted, sometimes it's not. I mean, quick show of hands, how many of you have ever had a frustrating experience with a government website? Okay. It's a lot of hands. How many of you have ever worked for the government? Okay, not as many hands as the people who have frustrating experiences. And I think this is actually a really interesting discrepancy, which is that a lot of us experience government in a very particular way. A lot of us are very prepared to actually go in and help the government improve. But whether it's because of you know, various conceptions around government work or whatnot, a lot of folks don't actually take the leap to go contribute. And I think it is one of the most fundamental privileges for us to be able to have experienced the government and to have contributed to the government. And now, um, especially in this day and age, there are so many opportunities to be able to do a tour of duty in government and do your part. If you're a technologist, you can apply to the US Digital Service, go you know, serve for a year or two years. You can join as a presidential innovation fellow, join for a year or so, go work for 18F within the General Services Administration. or we understand that a lot of folks aren't able to uproot their lives and move to DC, even if it's for a year. So we also have a lot of platforms like Code.gov where you can contribute back to government websites and different projects without ever stepping foot in a federal agency. I think the difficulty is really awareness. A lot of folks just aren't aware of the fact that there are so many opportunities. But it's not all incumbent upon the government to make sure that 
everyone is aware, I think it's also the individual, uh, the individual interest to give back. And in a way, we have a lot of um, polarity in the United States right now, politically speaking. And I think today is such a good forum for us to be speaking about this, which means that perhaps now more than ever is when the government needs you most. We need talented folks to come in to do the good work. And we were talking about this on a call before our conversation, which is that no matter what, unfortunately, I mean, this is kind of how politics works, after today, there will be a segment of the population that will be very upset or sad. And there will be a segment of the population that will be very happy and there will be rejoicing. But that doesn't come at the exclusion of good work no matter what the result is. And I think Kathy and I can attest to the fact that there are still a lot of good people fighting the good fight in government, doing work that they've been doing across administrations regardless of politics because the work is largely nonpartisan. And even though it doesn't get the press coverage that perhaps it deserves, it doesn't mean that the work isn't actually happening. So I think one of the messages that we also want to convey during this talk is that the government is still okay. And even though sometimes folks are disillusioned based on what's happening, we are still espousing good values and we have people who are very committed to the work that they've been doing for a long time. And some of these people are the unsung heroes that you'll never meet, but we need more of them. And I think if you all are ever interested in contributing, there are a lot of opportunities to do so, and I definitely would encourage you to, to do so. You picked on exactly what I, where I was hoping to take us next, which is to talk about uh, politics and, and to just ask uh, the question that I think, and I think you've answered, uh, about the extent to which technology development in government is a political um, animal or not. And Alvin, it sounds like in your experience there are at least components of it that, that really transcend the political. Obviously, that's not true of all of them. Kathy, I don't know if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> Definitely have thoughts. Um, I also wanted to... Um, wrap up one last thing I thought of as you were talking and when we actually just say public service what does that even mean yep. and like now public interest is like a big thing what does that mean um, there's obviously government which kind of is a clear line but then you also have well you work for a consulting company and you're building software for governments is that public service um, and or if you're working for a big company uh, as of you've seen recently like Google Amazon Microsoft etc and you're, you have contracts for your software for these for the government is that also public interest. Um, and that all kind of is the government. Um, and in many ways, if you really start digging, you're like, well, Google technically was funded by NSF in its early days. So that's also Google technically like started with the government as well. And so there's like all these ties that, that come together. And I just start thinking in like rabbit hole circles in my head. So, so thinking about that. Um, so basically a lot of things just go back to the government yep. regardless. Um, I think it's nice, it's a nice talking point to say that everything we work on in the government is bipartisan and completely apolitical. Um, it's a talking point we've said in, you know, with the U.S. Digital Service as well, but, and many things are, for example, let's say 500,000 veterans are not getting access to health care, and now we implemented something uh, that fixed like a technical glitch that made it so these people can get access to health care. That, for the most part, um, is a political, but if you're working on something, let's say at the Department of Education, that makes it easier to find out which for-profit universities are preying on you, and the leadership at the top no longer cares about that, and so maybe you just have to like redivert your engineering power somewhere else. Like you can try and say that's apolitical, but it it, it isn't. Um, so there are lots of different cases, or like you build, you build a system. Um, under one administration to bring to help bring in and vet more refugees into the country, and under a different administration, it's used for something else. These are all just real questions we have to ask, and to pretend to, to not not for you all to pretend for us to to to, to not think deeply about them um, would be an oversight. Um, so those are just real questions that I think all of us have had to ask. Like, what am I building? How would it be reused at different points in time? Um, and and how to really think about about that because the reality is that it could be um, used for different purposes. Um, you can say the same thing about like the stuff that Palantir sells or any of like the policing software um, under different groups of people and for different intentions and it could be used very differently. Um, bias aside, right? Like, um, so I, yeah, I, I think in, we can say that in some cases technology kind of is apolitical but it could definitely be used in different ways in governments. Absolutely, and I would echo that too. I think that if you look at a lot of folks who have stayed across administrations, a lot of the work that they're doing is most likely nonpartisan. Um, I think the easiest way to identify whether something is nonpartisan or not, or at least when you're making the case to a new administration or to a new boss, if you can find a way to really convey that your product or whatever it is that you're working on can save taxpayers money, 
then the federal government should invariably support a mission like that. The question is, what is the actual ROI on the investment that the government is putting in? Uh, how feasible is it that those taxpayer dollars are going, those savings are actually going to the right things? All of these are considerations that I think folks do need to take into account. Um, but I think federal taxpayer savings usually wins the day when you're trying to figure out whether you can save a nonpartisan project or yeah. not. I mean, USCS was founded under a Democratic president with a Republican Congress and funded by Republican Congress. So it's, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a case for saving taxpayer dollars yeah. in federal projects. Uh, I want to bring in voices from the room. Maybe I'll ask one more set of questions, which is a big one, and this is my you know, personal self-interest. I mentioned uh, at the beginning that we're doing a, a lot of work at the Berkman Klein Center thinking about government use and adoption of tools that are algorithmic in nature, artificial intelligence, machine learning, really new cutting-edge technologies. All, all technologies can have significant and sometimes unintended consequences, but I think it's particularly true with these new emerging technologies where uh, the people who are in charge of procuring them, sometimes even the people who are in charge of developing them, haven't fully thought through the ramifications, and there's a lot of debate going on right now about ways to ameliorate bias and technologies that are based on machine learning and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. If, as Alvin mentions, a lot of times tech procurement is driven by cost savings as you know, a, the primary or at least a primary metric, how do we how do we educate people? How do we get them thinking in a mindset that they really need to do? You know, an ethical impact yeah. assessment or something on some of these technologies mm -hmm. that they're that they're building is that is that something that's possible to do? I think it's possible, or at least I think that we have to believe it's possible and just strive for it. And I mean that with like no irony or laughter. Like I, I I really truly believe that we just have to believe that it's possible and think of all the ways we can impact that. So the, another hat I wear is um, I'm working on this thing called the Responsible Computer Science Challenge with Mozilla and Omidyar. Um, we have about three and a half million dollars to fund computer science programs to to um, so computer science is my background, computer science programs to integrate social responsibility, whatever that means for each entity, um, into their curriculum. And so to answer your question, I think it starts at the people building the software. Um, oh, the company just slipped in mind, the company that sells the, um, the, the technologies to the police, uh, to the court systems. Um, Yes. Yeah, it is like a group of data scientists who developed, um, and they, they, they developed it with, I'm sure, wonderful, great intentions, um, but it's like used in different ways, and they actually didn't take into consideration probably all the bias and unintentional, unintended consequences. So how do, we, how do we tackle that part of it? So people build this technology. So regardless of how good or bad people, the government is able to buy the technology, how do we retool and rethink about how we train um, the people who actually build the technology. In my own computer science education, there was like one ethics class, and it was like a joke class about like, here's scenario A and B, is this good or bad, and then you're basically done, right? Um, or like, company A did this, and company B did this, like which one was good or bad? Um, and it's like the class you take when you graduate, and it was a joke, so now let's rethink about how we build the technologies. Um, and then the second part of that was cool, now maybe we have technologies that were built with some of this in mind. Um, like you said, a lot of times, it's even a joke in government, that the lowest bid's gonna win, right? Like, c proposals are complicated, they're long, sometimes they're written by like, fresh out of college grads from these consulting companies, and they're just like these bohemist documents, and sometimes they're like, either relationships prevail, or the cheapest one wins, um, and, and then once you buy it, so we're, we're bad at, we uh, as a government, we're bad at buying the technology, and then we're bad at actually managing the projects. Um, so we have to get better at buying the technology, which is a thing that is the people are actively working on now. They're trying to change procurement in the government, and then also thinking of ways to bring in experts in the room, so that when we're buying a piece of, let's say, um, a piece of software for for a court system, there's someone who can actually look at it and say, this works or doesn't work. Um, USCS was only a team of 200. We've done a bunch of um, proposal vetting and just called out companies. I'm like, this actually doesn't do what either you said it would, or you think it does this thing, but it actually really doesn't. It's going to cause a lot more problems. Or you're planning on shipping this in two months, and it's going to fail, and background checks are just still not going to happen for people. Um, and it sometimes just takes a few people in the room who understand how tech works. So I think all of that has to happen. Yeah. But there are people working at it from different angles. Um, and I just I feel like you have to just believe that it could happen and figure out how to put the right people there. Absolutely. Um, I think having people in the room who actually understand it is crucial. And 
You know, I was a few months ago during the NATO summit, we had this panel where we were talking about the blessings and curse, curses of technology. And a lot of the focus in the conversation was about artificial intelligence. And obviously, there are a lot of blessings that come with AI. I mean, you, you lead our ethics working group at the Berkman Center for Ethics on AI, right? Ethics and tech. Ethics and tech. And so there are a lot of conversations that happen in that room. Different things like, you know, positive. For example, from an attorney's perspective, when you have a huge caseload, you can definitely lean on artificial intelligence and automation to essentially, with pretty good accuracy, tell you which cases you should probably take on. That saves a lot of time, net positive. But on the other side of things, if you go into a courtroom and you now have uh, artificial intelligence essentially determining whether somebody is guilty or not guilty, then you have a lot of questions around ethics because at that point, maybe the judge trusts the algorithm and believes that it's objective, but what a lot of people fail to re realize or sometimes neglect is that those algorithms were also created by human beings. So in a way, those are still subjective. Your hope is that they are the least subjective, I suppose. And then you go on to the other side of artificial intelligence, kind of the dark side, which is um, things like deep fakes. How many people in the room know what deep fakes are? Show of hands. OK. Not as many as I would hope. So deep fakes, and you, you all have probably heard of this at some point or maybe seen something like this. Um, it is essentially taking advantage of deep learning to transplant people's faces onto other people's bodies, or even using their voices to essentially mimic uh, somebody else. So you might have a uh, video of a politician saying something, and it looks very believable. It even sounds like them, but it's not actually them. Or you might have um, you know, revenge pornography being used through deep fakes. This is very troubling. This is criminal behavior taking advantage of uh, really advanced technology. Where we usually see this technology used is in things like Star Wars and Hollywood, where you have you know, Princess Leia coming back and her face is on someone else. And you're, everyone is so excited because we're able to bring back actors from back in the day, and it looks so real. But there is always another side to it which can be used for dark and nefarious purposes. And I think when it comes to these things, it's so important to have experts in the room when you're making these decisions. And for us, even maybe as a global community, to leverage our resources and best practices to determine maybe you know, whether there is a set of guidelines that we should follow when we're trying to essentially cure the negative effects associated with new and emerging technologies. Great. I'd love to get some voices in from the room. Anyone uh, have have questions, thoughts, concerns they want to share with our illustrious panel? We've got Ruben playing the Phil Donahue role. Rob. Hi. Um, really interesting talk, but I'd like to push back hard on one thing you just said. Um, you know, with respect to the way to show something is bipartisan is by showing that it saves money. Um, and, and first, uh, you know, personal confession, I know about wasting government IT money. I could tell you about the system I wrote in the 1970s for the state government that never saw the light of day yes. because of, you know, an adjacent scandal. Um, so many with, of those cases. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, the shame was it was an adjacent scandal. It itself should have been a scandal, but never mind. <laughs> um, I mean, <coughs> there are two ways I would I would push back on that. First. There was a flip in the way enterprises viewed IT in the 90s, where they went from thinking about it as cost saving to some, you know, something that would save costs and you should save costs on, to something in which you should invest. Um, um, and so I, I sort of just, in that large scope, I would push back onto it. But the second way I would push back onto it is how that sort of puts an implicit bias into what something like the, um, the digital service might choose to work on. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many problems, um, um, you know, in the government, you know, that would be fixed um, if we spent more money. Um, and, you know, whether that's food stamps or whatever they're being called now, you know, or health benefits or whatever. Um, so how, I mean, how, how do you square that circle? How, you know, how can you, or let me ask this, does it, I mean, internally in the government, does that really bias you to the certain, 
certain projects that are in this narrow consensus of, oh, we can't spend more tax dollars, you know, or, you know, is there a, you know, do you push back on that and, and do projects that might actually, you know, need to spend more dollars, um, but um, work for the greater good? Since caught out, yes, yes, I'll actually start by, I actually don't think, um, and maybe even Ms. Kamini, I actually don't think bipartisan means less money. So maybe that, I actually don't think I said that. So I, I actually don't believe that bipartisan means um, less money. And uh, it happens to be a talking point where, like, hey, one, um, like one argument for bringing in tech talent is that sometimes having in-house tech talent might be better than hiring a consulting company for for example, um, but that's just like one small part of the argument um, and isn't the ultimate argument, nor is it the decision on which projects to take on. The USDS model specifically um, is a model that is, we bring in people who are federal employees employed by the federal government who can go around and work on different projects versus going out and hiring, let's say like an IBM or Northrop or Lockheed or any, any um, big company to build software in-house, so it's just a bit of a different um, model. It's like in-house, I guess, work versus um, like ex hiring external talent. But I definitely don't think that those two are directly proportional where um, all, the, all the decisions are made simply on um, what can save money, period. Um, I actually think that would be a horrible metric. Um, and I would love to actually chat more about your thoughts on cases where more money spent on food stamps actually is better. There's, um, there's a lot of good work being done in the state of California on CalFresh um, and revamping that entire system, um, both saving money and increasing the user experience and finding more people who should be um, on services who are not on services. Um, and they found ways to just make the process more efficient uh, versus throwing more money at the CalFresh system. And they actually sued a contractor I'm sure like this happens all the time. The contractors are sued, they, they, they bid again, and they still get the same contract again or something. But the state of California actually sued a contractor because they failed. Um, and this team with Code for America actually were able to build something um, with, with less um, resources and funding that actually worked. So yeah, that's kind of a roundabout answer to your question. And I piggyback on that too, and I'd say that I think that saving money is one of many factors. I think. Um, depending on the product itself is a pretty hard factor, but I would revise it to say that it's not necessarily about saving money, but um, I would replace money with value, and that as long as it's generating value, I think it's important. No matter what, when you're investing, and I think part of your premise was we should be investing more, uh, which um, I think based on your hypothesis, investing is exclusive, is, and saving money are kind of mutually exclusive. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think that whenever you're investing, you want to be able to generate some sort of return on that investment. That doesn't necessarily have to be in the form of hard cash and taxpayer dollars, but it can be some sort of value generated for taxpayers. And as long as value is being created, I think that's usually um, kind of the, the calculus with which we approach a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve. Other questions? Um, I was wondering if you could speak more about the policing of potentially criminal activities regarding fringe technologies. So I know you briefly mentioned deep face, but it would be great to learn more about what the government is currently doing here and ways in which um, if people are interested in the audience, be it graduate students or young professionals, could potentially get involved in helping the government. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I don't have any specific examples about government working on those particular things. Um, and again, based on the fact that I'm speaking in my capacity as, as, a, as an affiliate here rather than the government. Um, but what I would say is as far as opportunities are concerned, there are a lot of opportunities to work in agencies that are working on emerging technologies. One of the agencies that works on a lot of emergency technology, emergent, emerging technologies, excuse me, is the General Services Administration. And so they have a lot of teams, including 18F and others, um, that are very open to having students come on for whether it's an internship or some sort of pathways program uh, to start working on these different issues. And uh, their various teams are, some of them are very ahead of the curve because we rely on them to essentially uh, tell us 
whether we should be considering various things as we're kind of vetting emerging technologies. Same goes with you know, uh, tech teams within the White House, the Office of American Innovation, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the CTO's office, our office, the office of the CIO. All of us are always trying to figure out specifically where technology is headed, how we can get ahead of it if possible, how we can prepare for it so that we are preemptively doing that preparation rather than trying to play catch up retroactively. It is very difficult because unlike the private sector, uh, we do, for better or for worse, and I think this is part of our discussion too, um, we are accountable to 300 million Americans. So it's not just our shareholders or just our board that we have to answer to. So we can't really move fast and break things, so to speak. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think that it's good and bad depending on what you're trying to achieve. But overall, I think it's net positive because it would be very irresponsible for us to move uh, so fast that we're not taking everything into consideration. And then as a result, basically uh, charging the taxpayers for our learning curve. I think that would be very responsible from the perspective of government. What that means is that we should be working more with the private sector to potentially take some of those risks um, in uh, conjunction with our advice and potentially have more of these public-private sector partnerships that I think are absolutely invaluable so that we can ensure that everybody is at the table uh, so we're not really solutioning in a vacuum here. And uh, with those emerging technologies, it's absolutely critical. But as far as opportunities for students are concerned, there are so many of them. And uh, I think it comes down to awareness. So if you are interested, please come on over afterward and I'm, I'm happy to share more. One um, resource to look up, um, just because they're local to Cambridge, is um, an assembly so the Berkman Klein and MIT Media Lab had an assembly project last year called AI Policy Pulse. Um, and a couple of people on the team included Jack Clark from OpenAI, Gretchen Green, um, and Amy Zhang, who are both fellows or affiliates this year at the Berkman Center. Um, and but between all of them, they have very deep expertise in engineering and law and, and wood making and open policies and a couple of other things. Um, but they spent a lot of time interviewing mayors and state legislators and I think other government officials on what kind of advising they need um, around just AI policy in general. I think Gret and Gretchen is advising the, the government, a, a government in Canada right now. But they're doing a lot of really interesting work around ways to get in the door for various levels of government to, to advise them on making decisions around different types of technologies beyond, I think starting with AI, but beyond. Sasha, did you want to jump in? Hey, thanks for a great, uh, great talk. This is a really interesting uh, conversation. Um, my question is, so, um, so we recently completed and launched this report called More Than Code, where we interviewed over 100 technology practitioners who were working on the public interest and using different language to talk about that. And one of the key findings of that report is uh, nothing about us without us, which is that people with lived experience of the domain area that you want to work on um, you know, need to be at the table as part of the uh, technology development you know, process the whole time. And another one of the key findings is, um, is well, basically it's the title of the report, which is more than code, which is that your team doesn't just need software developers. You need a bunch of different types of roles. You know. um, my question is in the context of working inside um, say digital services, or you're, you're working inside a, a government agency, you're working for the state, whether it's municipal or federal or state. Um, I'm wondering about sort of the tension between the reality that um, people who are marginalized are experiencing, um, you know, the worst of a, 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 in any particular domain area. Right, so like people trying to get access to housing in the Boston mm -hmm. housing market, which is crazy, and they can't get access mm -hmm. because they're uh, they're low income and it's a tight housing market, and there's all this. Anyway, so people in those situations always have organizations uh, that have a lot of domain knowledge um, about what's going on and what needs to be done to solve it. But um, there's sort of this barrier between a nonpartisan government agency that's working to improve user interface design for access to services, say, and the fact that the people with the most domain expertise are going to be already sort of organized and advocating for particular, uh, for particular policies. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear you sort of reflect on that tension, like how, how does that work? We know we need to have people with lots of deep lived experience and domain expertise on the design team, but um, if you're working from the position inside government, it can be politically difficult to say, well, we know that we need to have someone from the Tenants' Rights Coalition at the table as we're designing our 
I don't know, our interface for access to Section 8 vouchers or mm -hmm. something like that. So how do you deal with that? And give, give some concrete examples. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love this topic so much. Um, and if you haven't looked at More Than Code, please go look up that work. It's really, really fascinating. I am wholeheartedly on the boat of um, we have to bring people in the room with lived experiences. It's actually another facet where private sector also is notoriously bad for it. Um, government is so, in many cases, far behind. I've been told multiple times that user experience studies are illegal, meaning it's not OK to go talk to your community. Um, and that sounds silly, but it comes down to something called the Paperwork Reduction Act, which was well intended um, to make it so the government can't keep asking the same questions over and over and over again. And then it gets like morphed in like weird policy circles and product teams into you can't go talk to people. So this idea of just going out and talking to um, the people who might need Section 8 vouchers or talking to the people who are waiting like five hours in social service offices while they have a minimum wage job, like those are things that for the most part no one does unless there just happens to be a team on the ground or like if you went and worked for the federal government, you're like, hey guys, I have a great idea. We're just going to go and sit with these groups. It doesn't matter if I totally disagree with them politically. It doesn't matter if they're totally right, totally left, because like you said, Said, um, housing topics are political in many cases. Food stamps can get very political. Um, some states don't want people to have more access to food stamps. Like there's all these questions we should ask. Um, but I think a starting point is getting teams on the ground that are like, you know what, I'm going to go, if I'm working for the Veterans Affairs, I'm going to go and sit and talk with some of these veteran service organizations. I'm just going to go and plop myself in like eight different VA hospitals and just see what people are doing. I'm going to watch doctors try and use the, um, the VA's healthcare system. And that seems kind of simple, but it just doesn't happen. Um, so there are teams that have been doing that now. There are teams at the Department of Ed who, one of my favorite stories, there was a contract out for several years trying to launch this thing that um, tried, that was, um, Obama had this initiative to um, open up education data. Um, and this team led by Lisa Galopter and Erie Meyer and a couple of other folks came in and were able to launch it in, in a few months over the summer. And their user experience testing was they printed out like these mock-ups on paper that they drew, stood on the Washington Mall in front of the Smithsonian Museums and asked students what they thought of the, the, the interface um, and, and brought students in that way. But the Department of Ed just didn't naturally go and talk to students, even though it's catering to students. Or you might have people that are like, well, I have kids who are going to go off to college, so I know what they need. So I think a starting point really is just, yes, there are groups that are going to be political, but have product or engineering or design teams that know, you know what, we're, this is like a typical uh, product problem in general. Like There are going to be people who disagree with you always, who either love your product, hate your product, whatever. Bring them all in, um, get all their opinions, um, and, and figure out what to build. And you personally, you, not you, but like the engineer, the development team may personally have its own agenda for what it wants to build, but at least bring those perspectives to the table. We're not, we're not even there yet in government. Is there an opportunity to sort of, similar to the way that code.gov highlighted? Um, I don't know, found a lever to, uh, to broaden a process across many different agencies. Uh, is there something similar that could be done with user testing, user involvement yeah. in the design process, highlighting or and ultimately even requiring it, yeah, right? yeah. Um, but sneaking it in there, I don't know. Yes, there are, and, and agencies <coughs> like to copy each other. So for example, the Department of Defense did the hack the Pentagon um, bug bounty thing, um, which made it so that anyone can like hack the Pentagon and find um, and find vulnerabilities, which is pretty common for any tech company, right? Like Google does it all the time. And then a bunch of the other agencies are now starting to copy them. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of showing a model that works for an agency and then having people really just from the grounds up out there hustling and being like, hey, this worked over here. You should do it too. Um, yeah, I, and I really think it boils down to having just a few individuals in-house who can do it, like having one Alvin or one, like a few people from different like digital service teams and just like being out there yelling about this constantly and then people listen. <laughs> we look forward to uh, someday having ux.gov. <laughs> yeah. There's actually, um, this is not quite the same, but there's, um, USDS launched um, the, the US design standards, um, which is like a starting point. It's not even close to being ux.gov, but we definitely should have something like that.
Hi, uh, I was wondering that you described the, the people going out and doing some form of, you know, what you might call participatory design or uh, user experience, uh, you know, information gathering. Uh, what kinds of backgrounds do they tend to have? Because my experience is that this is the sort of work that doesn't come most naturally to computer scientists. <laughs> and if they're not computer scientists, then how do you manage the interface between, you know, social anthropologists, for example, yeah. who might be in, uh, employed in this role, um, and the kinds of accounts they give of what they found and how this translates back into actual requirements that can be implemented. Yeah. Um, I laugh because you're, you're absolutely right. Um, computer scientists, are, we're not trained to do, do that. Um, so one of the biggest, I think, one of, one of the biggest barriers to a lot of this is just the hiring process for all of this, right? How do we hire in for a UX role or an anthropology role or an ethnologist? ethnographer role, et cetera. Um, and in many cases, there isn't that role to hire into in any government. Um, there might be some governments that have thought of it, but for the most part, there aren't. Um, with specifically USCS, we made it so that we could hire people with those backgrounds. So we have a design team, or had, I, I left in March, um, of about at least 50 folks with that kind of background, people who are very well versed, well, well versed in ethnographic studies, who are well versed in focus groups, and survey in any number of ways to question individuals and communities to try and understand what they truly, really need. Um, so we found a way to hire those people in-house, recognizing that you can't just throw an engineer out there and they'll just magically know how to get all the information you need, nor are they experts um, in doing that. Um, I know that's not the greatest answer because it doesn't mean like we've solved all the problems, but that's one way we found to do it, the work. And I think this plagues a lot of private sector startups too, <clears throat> which is that leadership and designers typically um, assume that the, the types of people that they talk to are the types of people that they should be talking to. And so the issue is, the lazy way to do it is to reach out to your users and then say, hey, uh, let's have a user testing session. We want to know exactly how you've enjoyed the experience of this platform. Uh, you know, let's walk you through it and all that stuff. But you cut out a huge population, segment of the population, because the people who are your users are already there. The people who aren't there, a lot of times, are the people you want to come. So your users, you want to target the person who came once and left immediately. But you'll never be able to find that person if you're just focusing on your users currently. So I think it, it takes a lot of progressive thinking. I think, the, like, like I said, it's not just a public sector problem, but private sector as well. You need to figure out um, how you can reach out to not just your own networks, but leverage other people's networks too and challenge yourself to be a little bit uncomfortable to find people who you would never speak with because those are the people who will teach you something that you never knew. Can I ask a follow-up question? Do you think that there are implications for how we train computer scientists? Implications for what, I'm sorry? Do you think there's implications for how we train computer scientists, computer science education? Oh, yeah. Should computer scientists be enculturated to be more comfortable going out and talking to people, having the means to do this, having some sort of methodology um, yeah. you know, that is not currently part of many computer scientists' uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think what I mentioned earlier is one of the initiatives I'm working on is to think about how we train, change the way we change computer scientists. I think the reality is sometimes people go into computer science for certain things, and depending on personality, sometimes some people are just not great at those kinds of skill sets. I think the least we can do, though, is make sure what's ingrained in that culture is the recognition that the skill set is incredibly valuable. It's just as valuable as understanding data structures. It's just as value, uh, valuable as understanding algorithms, theory, et cetera. Um, the idea that you have to bring in the human component, the lived experiences, the user experience studies, um, and whether or not they want to tackle that as like their core competencies is up for debate, but at least making it known that this has to be part of how you develop software as well, whether it's you or you bring in someone who knows it. Because um, right now, it's seen as like a soft, fake, not real thing to many computer science curriculum, candidly. Um, so how do we change that? So I, yes, um, we have to change how we, we train computer scientists. And I think that's a huge opportunity. Baking anything into a computer science curriculum, I think, is one of the best ways to really train folks early on instead of trying to correct improper behavior. We're even doing that with open source now where we're uh, working with various schools to figure out how we can even bake something like code.gov into their curriculum uh, to ensure that they're from the very beginning understanding how valuable open source software is. I mean, you know, uh, 
the internet potentially was uh, was arguably built on the backs of open source technologists who uh, shared um, just this wealth of information that was completely um, basically decentralized across the country and across the world. And uh, to not give something like sharing and collaboration through open source software the credit that it deserves is, is irresponsible. And I think a lot of times computer science curriculum, um, they focus on how can you build something that a bunch of people will use and pay for. And it comes at the expense of how can you leverage this incredible network of computer scientists and others across the, the world to not only learn but to, to give back so that you can um, essentially take advantage of a diversity of perspectives. And I think that comes back to, to your question as well. Making it in early is important. Something I want to add, but also kind of counter a little bit, is sure. I feel like the computer science curriculum teaches people how to build things a lot of people will use. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely this mentality, that I'm going to go change the world, mm -hmm. I'm going to use software, and it's going to do so much good. And actually, the money part is kind of, if you actually ask most Google engineers how much revenue Google brings in, they'll probably look at you with a total blank stare. Like, the money part is kind of sure. on the side. It's this genuine deep belief that you're changing the world through technology when you're actually sometimes building things that are not mm. ideal yeah. because you don't bring in the user perspective or the communities, et cetera. So how do we change that mentality? Two more here and here. Hi, my name is Uli. I'm uh, one of the Neiman Fellows, meaning I'm a journalist and I'm working with the data team. So um, I'm very much in favor of the idea of publishing code. We are also publishing our code to be more transparent uh, how we get to our results. But we made the experience that not a lot of people reuse it because it's always very specific. Mm -hmm. So I'd be yeah. interested in how many private firms really reuse the code on uh, data.gov. And uh, is it more perhaps for the agencies to know or track better how they are acting and not repeating work? Yes. So uh, thank you for the question. I think. Um, the primary kind of impetus for code.gov in general was to figure out how we can take the, the corpus of code that we already have across the government and make sure that we're not spending money on duplicative code. And so that comes, uh, you know, that basically translates to potentially billions of dollars of, of savings. I think the second part of that is figuring out how we can train these agencies to release code that is useful to the public. And uh, a lot of that comes down to good documentation, uh, easy discovery, and, um, and also uh, this, this concept of not giving the agencies all the say in what to release, because a lot of folks don't actually know what others find valuable. Um, but having this baseline requirement where you should feel encouraged to release everything and then let the community determine which ones are more popular or more useful. And then once you get that signal, then potentially focus more of your energy and resources on those, maybe even have those be part of some sort of hack day or hackathon with the government and the public um, to, to make those a little bit stronger so that a lot of people can take advantage of it. Because you know, we all know that not every single piece of code is universally applicable or useful. Uh, but at the same time, there are certain sets that are very useful for government purposes. There are certain sets that would be uh, very useful to the public. And then there are certain sets that would just be very interesting, just from a transparency perspective. For example, NASA has open sourced one of its mission control frameworks. That's amazing. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to use it. But just to be able to go into NASA's mission control framework, look at the code, you can even fork it and, and reuse it as a data visualization tool. I mean, like that's pretty cool. Um, but if they were to say, how many people are actually going to use this? And the answer were, was potentially not that many folks in the public. That might have uh, resulted in them not releasing it in the first place, which I think would be a shame. So I think there are, there are a lot of different public interests, mm -hmm. and one of, one of many would be whether the public would use it or not. And are you even tracking if the code is reused by private firms? Absolutely. And thankfully, um, with different platforms like GitHub and others, we're able to work with their API to, to really figure out how many of these different projects are being reused, forked, and for what purposes. And then through uh, regular check-ins with our agencies, we're able to ask them uh, whether they are using other uh, agencies' code and whether other agencies have used their code. So through that cross-referencing, we're able to come up with a more accurate set. And can you say how much is it, approximately? How much is what? How much projects have been reused? How many have been reused? Um, so right now, we are in the process of calculating that. It's difficult when you have over 4,000 projects that have been released. Also, the program in and of itself 
is two years old. In the private sector, that's an eternity. In the government, that's a little baby. And so um, I think we are still in the process where we are putting in a lot of training and resources to our agencies to ensure that they are sharing their code responsibly. And once they really understand how to do that and provide proper documentation, et cetera, then I think the next phase of maturity is really making sure that we calculate those numbers as well. A small add and maybe a fun, fun, fun side project for you is it's always interesting to see how creative people tend to use policies. So opendata.gov has been around for a while. Um, and I think the wording was something like machine readable format. And there are literally things like JPEG image files of spreadsheets or something that are <laughs> uploaded in the open data repository. You're like, what am I doing with a photo of a spreadsheet? <laughs> but it's like machine readable. Yep. And so it'll be interesting actually to see if there are weird yeah. uses like that for the code as well. Absolutely. Time for one more. Yeah, thank you for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, like at Berkman and at Digital HKS, there's a lot of talk about public interest technology, but at the en engineering school, there's relatively yes. little to none. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what you thought needs to be done at Harvard or at universities in general to help solve that talent problem of people going into yeah. public interest areas, government or government adjacent. That's a, a very big topic of conversation around these these parts right now, so. Yeah. Well, it's one of the reasons I came to Berkman. I wanted to think more about this. So I'm like, why are my people not coming into this space? Um, Harvard Sees is thinking about this for sure. Mm -hmm. um, people like Jim Waldo um, and Barbara Gross um, and the provost, I guess, of Harvard. Um, and then Bruce Schneier also just released something around public interest geared towards technologists. So it's in the infant stages. If there's something you're interested in, like this is the time to like dive in and find all these people and figure out how to help build it out. Um, you're right, it's just not an area that is the highest priority right now. Um, Stanford just, re is, they're gonna start a new course next, again, these are all like elite schools, but like Stanford just start, is starting a new course either next spring or fall that has the three professors in engineering, policy, and philosophy um, teaching a class that will replace one of their core classes. Um, hopefully trying to steer Silicon Valley in a different way. So like a bunch of things popping up. Um, ethics is like another kind of gateway into that a little bit. Um, but there, these, all these things are like literally starting right now. I think ultimately it comes down to the schools themselves and the professors. I think a lot of uh, professors, and, and Chris, you can, you can correct us if we're wrong, but a lot of them don't actually talk about this uh, enough and they're not telling their students that these are even opportunities worth considering. Uh, at, at Harvard, there were a couple of undergrads who created something called Coding It Forward uh, within the last year or so. And I think programs like that are a good opportunity. That program specifically um, basically matches uh, computer science undergrads with federal agencies so that they can go and do an internship within a federal agency, work on a tech platform, and it be exposed to the fact that there are incredibly meaningful projects you can work on outside of the private sector. So I think if we have more programs like that, if we focus on the professors themselves and the academic programs, uh, putting a premium on the government as yet another potential career path that is certainly worth exploring, we can definitely kind of catalyze that sort of culture shift too. But I think it starts from the top and then trickles down. The only thing I'd add to that is just to say that academic institutions in general tend to be very siloed institutions and these kinds of considerations aren't necessarily interdisciplinary. And um, and so I think there's a lot of work going on now. Yeah, I can speak only to Harvard to try and bridge some of those gaps through people like Barbara Gross and others who are doing really interesting work. We have this Techtopia program program that's getting off the ground now, which is an interdisciplinary program with a cohort drawn from schools around Harvard, the assembly program you mentioned. So um, interdisciplinarity seems to be the key and breaking down some of the walls that have traditionally stood yeah. between institutions. And I mean, so, Chris, I yeah. think you can attest to this too. We worked on a project together yeah. in the Cyber Law Clinic and we had a call where we had a bunch of different federal agencies right. on the line with uh, an individual from the law school, a couple yeah. of students, and they walked away with it thinking what? I mean, what, they were just like student. blown away, oh, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, from a student perspective, this is a no-brainer. Like, yeah. All the students recognize coming in that this is the future and this is yeah. the way we have to operate. It's getting institutions to function in this way, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Join me in thanking Alvin and Kathy, and go out and vote if you haven't already. Thanks so much, guys. Thank